Good morning. Welcome to the United Methodist Church at the Dunes. Welcome to church. It's so good to see you. Good morning and welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here this morning. Welcome to church. We're glad you're here. Good morning. I'm glad you're joining us for worship. Welcome to church. We're glad you're here. Hi. Welcome to Church of the Dunes. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Now is the time to worship. Good morning and welcome to the United Methodist Church of the Dunes, Grand Haven, Michigan. I'm Pastor Lou Grattenberger. We welcome you to the service of worship and remind you that we worship both online and in person. And together we are one wonderful congregation serving our community and our world. This time I'd invite Carla to share a little bit about what's going on in our church. Good morning. The United Methodist Committee on Relief is asking for support. This organization, which we often refer to as UMCOR, is currently serving many who have been affected by historic wildfires and hurricanes. COVID-19 is complicating relief efforts. If you'd like to find out how you can help make a difference for UMCOR, please check out today's bulletin. You can find it on the church's website. This Halloween will look a little bit different for many children and families, and so the children's ministry team at Church of the Dunes is planning some extra fun for the season. Later this month, there will be a Halloween drive through car parade featuring decorated cars and goodie bags. For all the details about that, please check out Thursday's weekly announcement email, or you can also find information in today's bulletin. Thanks for making worship with Church of the Dunes an important part of your week. Let's join Pastor Lou. I invite you now into the spirit of worship. God who is one, you call us to be one. May we be one with all who are made in your image. God who is three, you call us to be community. May we find community with all who are called by your name. God who calls us all by your name, may we find our place in your eternal family. God Almighty, today, by the power of your Spirit, we unite in prayer. We unite with all our sisters and brothers in Christ. We unite with our sisters and brothers from all Christian churches and denominations. We unite with all who are joined by the Holy Spirit of God. We unite with followers from every church and congregation. We unite with God's sons and daughters from every creed and culture. Let us worship as one. And now I invite you to sing with me, In Unity We Lift Our Song.
morning, boys and girls. Um, behind me each Sunday morning, uh, most of the time, you see one of these windows. Um, this is what we call stained glass. When I was a little boy, one of the best stories I ever heard was from an older gentleman in our church who had been part of buying the giant stained glass window that we saw every Sunday. When we saw that window, we saw a picture of Jesus with beautiful light shining through, but it hadn't always been that way. The gentleman told me and the congregation that day that when they ordered that window, they had great plans for it when they were building the church. And when that window came and he was called down to see the window, he was so disappointed. When they took the window out of the box, it was all dark. And he thought, we have made the greatest mistake ever. And he went home to tell his wife that he thought that the committee had made a grave mistake in buying this window. It was not at all what they expected. But then he received a phone call to come quickly down to the church the next morning. And so he ran down to the church. The window had now been installed in its place. And shining through the window was a beautiful beam of light. And what had been dark was a beautiful picture of Jesus. And he knew that what had made the difference was the light shining through the window. I pray that you will allow the light of Jesus to shine through you. When we allow the light of Jesus to shine through us, it makes all the difference think this week how you might allow the light of Jesus' love to shine in you through the things you do and the things you say. Will you pray with me? Dear God, remind us of your love and your light. Remind us to allow you to shine through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you join me in our invitation to God's forgiveness through our prayer of confession? God of mercy, in our impatience for answers, we sometimes turn to idols of our own making and forget our covenant with you. Passionate for what is right, we wrong those with whom we differ. Pleased at the invitation to your banquet, we fail to arrive with humility and thanksgiving. Forgive us when our faith is weak and our zeal too strong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do not worry. The Lord is near. God hears our prayers with compassion and with abundant, steadfast love. Rejoice, for in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. At this time, we remember our God and our thankfulness by giving to God. We invite you to send your gifts to the United Methodist Church of the Dunes at 717 Sheldon in Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417 or to get online and give your gifts through our online giving modalities that you'll find at our website. Will you pray with me, please, a spirit of dedication of what we give to God. Let us pray together. Mighty God, deserving of all honor and praise, we bring our gifts this morning, remembering that the offering you truly seek is the offering of our whole lives. Help us, we pray to live a life that is worthy in your sight. When we struggle and stumble, help us up and put us on the path. On the advice of the Apostle Paul, may our lives be focused on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, so that our offering may be pleasing in your eyes. In Christ's name we pray. A reading from the New Testament, Philippians 4, 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Iodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I, again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
We continue now in our study of the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off your gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off all the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, Why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. How you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And all this land I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. May God bless this reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. Let us bow now in prayer. Lord God, Open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to you, that we might have fresh instruction and fresh power for our lives. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Fickle. (laughs) I kind of remember when I learned this word. I think I learned it from a friend uh, that I went to elementary school with. That word, fickle, it sounds a little like tickle, it smells a little like pickle. But when forced to make a choice, feeling the bind, I learned a fickle person changes his or her mind. When I hear about the Israelites, when I read their story, I see a fickle lot of people. They immediately, when they had problems, blamed God. They blamed Moses, not once, but several times. At first, they're thanking God, patting Moses on the back for a job well done. But it didn't last long, and they were after him again. This time, Moses goes up the mountain. He goes up to mountain to listen to God's voice to help his people, and the people become impatient. And when Aaron, the other leader, shows up, they said, I don't know what they've done with Moses, but we need your help. But apparently Aaron wasn't exactly the leader they needed, although it was the leader that uh, that they chose. Because he tells them what they want to hear, but not what they need to hear. Aaron provides an easy and a wrong-headed solution to the problem that they have, that they're not experiencing the power of God. Moses has gone up. He's talking to God. He's going to come back shining with the presence of God. But they're so impatient that before he gets there, they begin building. Well, in fact, they complete building an idol, a golden calf made out of the remnants of their rings and their earrings 
and Aaron is the enabler, the one that helps them to accomplish this new mission of forming an idol. God notices what they are doing even before Moses leaves the mountain. And Moses is told by God, and these are the words God uses, your people, <laughs> the ones you brought out of Egypt, are acting perversely. And God explains this perversity in two ways. The Israelites are building an idol which is a complete rejection, you'll remember, of the basic rules that we talked about last week. Have no other gods before me. Form nothing in my image. Don't worship other gods. And then the second thing they do is they rewrite the history of their salvation. And they write this new idol into the story. They make the idol the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt. This twisting of their faith story and the minimizing of God's role in their life is a perversion of faithfulness. When we look back and rewrite our story and write God out of the story, we've missed something. God views their fickleness and unfaithfulness with, well, frankly, with disgust. And the scriptures even say, with anger. God basically tells Moses, Get them out of here. Well, in fact, you get out of here and I'll take care of them. God says, I'll start over, though, with you, Moses. Once we've dealt with these people, I will start with you and form a new promise. Now, this is a turn of events that we're not expecting after the laborious nature of the story of the people leaving Egypt and wandering in the wilderness and finding their way to the promised land. And when Moses is invited to start over, we think he might just take the bait. Why not? God gets rid of the belly acres and the malcontents, and then Moses gets to start over with a new lot of people. This had to be tempting for Moses. Moses surprises us all then instead, instead of accepting God's idea. Moses begins to make a case for the Israelites and for God. Moses intercedes. The scripture uses the word implores. Moses implores God. He uses his best powers of persuasion. And he says, you save these people, Yahweh. In essence, he's saying they are valuable. They have valuable, they have value because of your action, God. If you destroy them now, you will lose the power of the witness of the presence of the people. Egypt will point to you, my God, our God, as arbitrary with grace, fickle of heart. And they will say that God didn't didn't keep God's promises. You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the stars, Moses reminds God. And so this becomes another moment in the history of humanity when God, God's love, was proved to be steadfast. Because God, we are told, Repents. God's irritation and anger have spelled the end of a relationship with the Israelites. But instead, God, we are told in the scripture, repents, turns away from his anger and proves God's holiness and justice and grace. Now, this again is an unexpected turn. This was in part due to Moses' intercession. Once again, Moses has helped save the Israelites. They were walking through troubling times. Something that Jane Cranston refers to as a season of maturing. I like that. They were going through a season of maturing. Seasons of maturing are things that make people stronger. And it did. It made Israel's faith in God even stronger, that God would forgive them, repent, and turn back toward them and bring them on through. In our epistle reading this morning, we find a letter that was sent by Paul to the church at Philippi. 
Christians were experiencing just such a season, a, a season of maturing. I guess you might say Paul was too, because most of the remnants of this letter indicate that Paul was in chains or in prison. And Paul says, but we're all on the same team, partners in Christ Jesus. You may be preaching for one reason, I preaching for another. But we have a common witness, Philippians 1.8 says. He, in fact, Paul goes so far as to say that I don't care what the motives of these multiple preachers might be. If Christ is preached, that's all that matters. Oh, that would be helpful to us as we try to work in an ecumenical fashion even today. Chapter 2 of Philippians, we didn't read that today, but it is dedicated to Paul's admonition to find proper motivation for sharing the gospel. He says you start from a place of humility. Preach and speak in humility, Philippians 3.15 reminds us. Paul says, in fact, he uses the word, all of us who are mature should take such a view. Mature people start from a place of humility. In effect, he reminds us that none of us is perfect. We're, we're just pressing toward perfection. We're on a race course of life that leads to a crown of glory. It's so tempting in times of trial to bite instead of bless our neighbor. Let's allow our struggles and challenges to strengthen our hearts and minds. Allow our times of hurt, pain, to become seasons of maturing. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known. The Lord is near. This is his counsel for seasons of maturing. We today are in one of those seasons, and so we hear these words with fresh ears. Don't worry, Paul says. Pray for strength. Thank God for everything. And the outcome, God will give you peace of mind and heart. During this season, again, don't worry. Pray for strength. Thank God for everything. And the God of peace will be the God of your mind and the God of your heart. We move from fractured and frenetic to focused and faithful. It is a renewed sense of peace that we seek today. Well, I hope you do. So Paul instructs, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We don't do things that we don't first think about. We make moves toward what is important and what matters and making a difference when we meditate on these things. If this is a season of maturing, we must keep doing the things we have learned, received, and heard in scriptures from those faithful who have gone before us. We must not fall back into old patterns of behavior, but instead continue to stand fast on the promises of God, who is always steadfast. Even when we're not so pure and holy, even when we struggle, God guides us to a place of peace and invites us to forget our fickleness and to embrace God's faithfulness. Our faith grows from that faithfulness, from God's faithfulness. It begins there. Meditate on these things. And the God of peace will abide in your hearts and minds. I invite you now to pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you for teaching us this day out of your scriptures. 
reminding us of your ways, treasuring who you are, reminding us to put you first in our life, for often we fail to do that. In our fear or discontent, our sadness or our anger, we run from you. But in our scriptures today, we learn that even you change your mind, that you are not driven by by revenge or frustration, but always driven by love. We pray that we might be as well. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and as we go from this place, that we might be reminded to be repentant, to offer ourselves more fully to you by moving away from selfish motivations and toward you and your direction. We pray for those who are hurting today, for those who are ill, for those who are incarcerated, for those who are hospitalized, for those who experienced accident or injury, emotional upheaval, mental incapacity, whatever the situation, we pray for your healing, Lord, and your life, that you'll release us from the bondages of this world and satisfy us with your steadfast love. We pray all these things in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You join me now in our final hymn, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. taken time to meditate on the things that are most holy, on the one who is the Holy One. Go renewed, strengthened, compelled to share the love of Jesus with everyone. We pray these things in God's precious name.